Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of February. Overall, I've got to say February was a pretty good reading month. I was mostly reading things I was enjoying. I didn't have as many new favorites as I did in January, but I did continue to be reading a lot of really great books, which was exciting. There were a few misses for sure, but I would say more hits than anything else. I had a week where I didn't read as much as usual because I was traveling, so I was kind of surprised how high my numbers ended up being. I think maybe I was reading more to compensate for that week. Anyway, we're going to get into all of it. If you are new to my end of month wrap ups, the way that these work is I'm going to start by going over my reading stats for the month. I enjoy this. Some of y'all do as well. But if stats are not your thing, you are more than welcome to skip forward to where I start actually talking about all of the books that I read. Then I will go through through the books beginning with my DNFs or books I chose not to finish, then my lowest rated books moving up to my highest rated books. About half of these books I did talk about at greater length in my mid-month wrap-up or maybe discussed in other videos. For those books I'm just going to tell you the book and the star rating and I will direct you to wherever you can find more information. I will link my mid-month wrap-up up above and I will mention any other videos for some of these books where I had projects if you're interested. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into my reading stats. In February, I read 35 books for a total of 11,104 pages, which is an average page count of 383 pages per day, which is slightly on the high side for me. So I feel like even though I didn't feel like I read quite as much as usual, I was still reading a lot. To be fair, I had a few of these that were novellas, graphic novels, things like that, so that probably made the numbers look a little bit higher, but yeah, pretty pleased with that. This month I only DNF'd one book, we are going to talk about it, 23 of the books that I read were advanced reader copies or books for review, so a very high number this month. I did not have any rereads. Eight of the books that I read were either indie, self-published, or small press. Three of them were graphic novels or manga, and I read one book in translation. In terms of format, I did listen to a lot of audiobooks, which is typical for me, but I read an unusually high number of ebooks. That's usually my lowest. I mean, it still is my lowest, but it's slightly higher than usual. This month I listened to 20 audiobooks. I read 10 physical books and 5 ebooks. So kind of a, a wide range there. Taking a closer look at those audiobooks, 13 of them are what I term shelf, which means I had a physical copy on my TBR shelf and I got it off through audio or primarily through audio. And in terms of where the audiobooks are coming from, three of them were from Audible, four of them were from Everand, previously Scribd, four of them were from my library, four of them were audio review copies from NetGalley, and five of them were from Libra.fm, including some audio review copies that I am gifted in exchange for mentioning them. I do love Libra.fm, they are linked down below if you want to go and check them out and support your local indie bookstores. I love them, I love what they do, and if you're an audiobook listener they're definitely worth a look. Next let's look at target age demographics. This month 24 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience, Eight of them were YA and three of them were middle grade. This is pretty par for the course for me, primarily adult but a little bit of other age categories. In terms of publication date, the oldest book that I read was published in 1942. I read nine books that were published prior to 2023. These are my backlist titles. I read five 2023 releases and 21 2024 releases. So pretty heavy on the front list this month, which makes sense given how many books I had for review. Normally those numbers are a little different. Taking a look at author demographics, I do value reading diversely and so I track this every month. My goal is to read about 50% from Black, Indigenous, and personal color authors and at least 25% from openly queer authors. Authors. In February, 43% of the books that I read were from members of the LGBT plus community, and 48.6% of the books that I read were by Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, which is not quite to my benchmark, but pretty close. And of that number, 25.7% of them were by Black authors, which was an emphasis given that it was Black History Month. Next, let's look at genre. We are back on my fantasy bag. <laughs> So 12 of the books that I read this month were fantasy, five of them were horror, only four were romance, this includes one contemporary romance and three speculative romance. Speculative is going to be your sci-fi, fantasy, and paranormal romance. I also read three science fiction books, three historical fiction, three memoirs, 
two contemporary fiction, one nonfiction, one poetry, and one thriller. So a bit of a range there and more nonfiction than usual this month. Next, let's take a look at my star ratings. Like I said, I was primarily reading things I was really loving this month, and I think you're definitely going to see that played out. This month, the lowest rating that I gave was a two and a half star. I didn't give anything below that. I gave two books two and a half stars, two books got three stars, two books got three and a half stars, six books got four stars, nine books got four and a half stars, 13 books got five stars, it's a lot, and one book got six stars, and in my personal rating scale, a six star read is a favorite of the year. This is not typical for me. Usually four stars is my most given rating. So this is very unusual. I was reading a lot of great books, which is exciting. My average rating this month was a 4.3 that's very high, so I'm not mad about it. That's wild. Lastly, let's take a look at my progress on my reading challenges for the year. I like to set a few of these for myself to get to different things, and I did make a little bit of progress. So far, I have read two books on my nonfiction TBR, one out of the five books on my classics TBR, and have completed one out of the ten series on my series completion TBR for the year. So those are my stats. I feel like it's been a really good month. Let's go ahead and dive in and talk about all of the books that I read. I will start with my DNF. I had one of them and then my lowest rated books and we'll get into all the great ones. Book I DNF'd was definitely a disappointment and I'm gonna say that the marketing on this is extremely misleading. That is Remedial Magic by Melissa Marr. I was sent a copy of this for review from Bramble, which is Tor's kind of romance, fantasy romance line, and and the premise sounded great. This was pitched as a cozy, witchy, sapphic fantasy romance, and I was like, great, I'm in. I love cozy fantasy. I love sapphic romances. This sounds like fun. This was not what I expected, <laughs> and the, the description on the back all of the marketing is super misleading about what this book actually is. And maybe if it was a little more accurate, it might have reached a better audience. But it was not for me. I ended up DNFing this, I think around the 29% mark. So first of all, this is not cozy at all. It has a lot of POVs. It's not just focused on this one sapphic relationship. There's a whole bunch of perspectives. And the opening scene is a mom in the car with her teenage son on the run from her abusive husband and then they get in a serious car accident. Like that's the start of the book. Um, there is also a gay man with cancer. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It's, there is maybe a sapphic romance that's gonna happen in here. So like there are queer characters and stuff, but I was not enjoying the reading experience. It was not at all cozy. It was not what it was billed to be. So if you're going to pick this up, just be aware, you know, maybe you'll enjoy it, but it was, it, the marketing was inaccurate. So I ended up DNFing this, unfortunately, just heads up if you're planning on picking it up. And that was a bummer. Moving on, let's talk about my two and a half star reads. This month there were two of them, and one of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book is A Tempest of Tea by Hafsa Faisal, so go check out my mid-month wrap-up if you want to hear more. I also gave two and a half stars to The Emperor and the Endless Palace by Justinian Huang. This was a very interesting book, and I, wa <laughs> I wasn't really sure what kind of a rating to give it or how even to evaluate it because it's not really like anything that I've read before. It's being pitched as a political fantasy romance. I like if I if I review this as a romance it kind of fails for me. If I review it as more of like an erotic political fantasy story with multiple lives and reincarnation it fares better <laughs> but it's interesting. It is very sex forward, very heavy on sex, lighter on the romance, and the the characters are immature and toxic and abusive at times, so I can't say that I was necessarily rooting for anyone to be together, but it is more interesting if you read it as a very erotic queer fantasy with these sort of past lives and a cursed star-crossed love across multiple lives um, reaching all the way back into ancient China. That part of it is interesting. Again, 
heavy on the eroticism, very graphic, and also a lot of drug use. So I don't, I don't know. It's an interesting book. I feel like the right reader could really love it. I, I had mixed feelings. So I ended up landing on a two and a half star, but do with that what you will. The cover is beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's very unique. There are parts of it that I thought were very cool and very engaging. I liked some of the historical, because there's three different timelines and the historical timelines, especially the most ancient one, I was really invested in. I thought it was quite interesting, even if I didn't necessarily love it as a romance per se. It's twisty, there's some reveals at the end, so I think if you know what you're getting into when you go into this you could really enjoy it. <sighs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, but because it's a romance I, I kind of split the difference and called it a two and a half star, so do with that what you will. Next let's talk about my three star reads. This month there were two of them. One of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book is The Hurricane Wars by Thea Guanzon. I thought I gave this a three and a half but I guess it was a three. This was our Patreon book club pick. It's a positive three though. I liked it and I would read book two. Anyway I, I talk about this in my mid-month wrap-up so. I also gave three stars to These Fragile Graces, This Fugitive Heart by Izzy Wasserstein. Another book book that is very interesting and I have mixed feelings about certain elements of it. So this is a sci-fi novella that is dystopian noir. So it's definitely got noir vibes, it's set in a dystopian future, and it follows a trans woman in a neighborhood who used to be belong to this anarchist commune, but over a disagreement she left and also broke up with her girlfriend. Now the girlfriend has died and has possibly been murdered and so she's determined to find out what happened. So it's got a murder mystery plot engine. It's definitely got those kind of, you know, slightly depressing noir detective vibes, but in, but like a techno thriller. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. There are clones in it and there's a thing that happens. I don't, I won't spoil it because it's close to the end. You can find it if you look at very many of the book reviews, but um, it's weird. <laughs> like there is a plot choice that was weird and I, didn't love it. I think the author knows it's weird because she has an author's note addressing it and I get what she was trying to do. I still think it's a weird choice and I don't know that I love it. I'm also mixed feelings about the noir thing. I don't know. It was interesting. There were things I liked about it and things that I was like, mm, I'm not so sure about this. I ended up landing on a three star read, but if that sounds up your alley, maybe pick it up. Next are my two three and a half star reads. The first one is Crown Chasers by Rebecca Coffendaffer. Some of my patrons picked this as a book that they wanted to see me read and do an exclusive reading vlog for, which I did. I also read this while I was going to Disney World with my family, so they got some vlog footage of that, um, which was fun. I liked this. I didn't love it, but I don't think that's anything against the book. I think the book is doing exactly what it intends to do. It is a rompy YA space adventure and it's fun and I think it does that well. I think if you're looking for something that's just like a fun good time, it's got a reluctant heroine who is forced into this competition to win the crown of the empire. Even though she didn't necessarily want to rule, it's got some twistiness. It's got a queer devil make hair heroine who's probably like pansexual or something. It's fun. And I think that that's really all it's trying to be. It's a rompy good time. So I don't really have a lot of criticism for it. I just think when I was reading it I maybe wanted a little bit more in terms of, you know, character development or themes. And it, I, I just think this book isn't interested in doing those things as much. I mean there are themes and there are characters and there is some development of it. So I'm not saying it's not there. I like more because I'm more of a character driven reader than a plot driven reader. If you're a plot driven reader you'll probably eat this up. And I still had fun with it. I liked it. Yeah, it, I think it, it was what it wanted to be. It did a pretty good job of it. For me it was a three and a half star. I also gave three and a half stars to Raiders of the Lost Heart by Joe Segura. This was a lot of fun. I think I'm, I'm a little bit of two minds about this because I do think there are some valid criticisms of this book, but at the same time it was entertaining and I like what it was trying to do. It's kind of Indiana Jones meets Lara Croft in a contemporary romance. It's got a Latine heroine as the lead 
and kind of a rivals to lovers plot. I think if you can read this, take it at face value, don't take it too seriously, you'll probably have fun with it. I think if you stop to like think super hard about some of it, there start to be some holes that show up. There's also the fact that some things that the hero does are pretty reprehensible in my opinion and I don't know that we got enough of a grovel from him to make up for it but it was fine like it was fun it was an entertaining read I liked it I didn't totally love it I think it has some weaknesses but as a debut novel with a really fun premise it's decent it wasn't everything I wanted it to be but I like the direction it was going. I would love to see more like this. I would like to see more of this kind of archaeologist fun thing. That would be great. All right, moving on, let's take a look at my four star reads. This month there were six of them and four of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Daddy by Victor Lavelle, Cushiel's Chosen by Jacqueline Carey, The Exvangelicals by Sarah McCammon, and The Luminous Life of Lucy Landry by Anna Rose Johnson. If you want to hear about any of those, you can go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four stars to Mercy Volume 1 by Mirka Andolfo. This I had for a review from NetGalley. It's a horror graphic novel that's got kind of a Victorian gothic vibe to it and also like a sprinkling of what feels kind of like cosmic horror. So so it was pretty good. I liked it. I think the art is beautiful and disturbing. It, it's, it's horror. So, you know, there's a lot of that on page, but I liked this. I don't know how much I can say about this without giving stuff away. It's set at the end of the 1800s and it follows a mysterious woman who comes to a town where there's an old mine that has been closed down and monstrous things. I don't want to say too much, but I did like this. I gave it four stars. Would recommend if you're looking for a horror graphic novel to try. I'm gonna have to change the battery in a second. Let's see if I can get through my next book first. I also gave four stars to The Cursed Rose by Leslie Vetter. This is the final volume in a trilogy that is really fun. This is a YA fantasy series that's like a gender flipped Sleeping Beauty meets Indiana Jones and I, I love it. The whole series is a lot of fun. There is a sapphic romance, there's strong friendships, there's twists and turns, there's magic, there's danger, there's archaeology type stuff and curses and evil witches. It's it's just a really good time and I think this is a very solid conclusion to a trilogy. I am excited to see what else we get from Leslie Vetter in the future because this was her first book series and I think that they're all pretty great. So uh, if you haven't tried them, highly recommend The Bone Spindle is book one and thank you so much to Penguin Teen for sending me a copy of book three. I really liked it. I gave it four stars would recommend the series. I'm gonna go change the battery and then we're gonna move on to my four and a half star reads. All right, we are back. And I think I had nine four and a half star reads this month. And four of those I talked about in my mid-month wrap up or other places. Some of these I also talked about in other places. Those books are The Wonder Engine by T. Kingfisher, House of Flame and Shadow by Sarah J. Mass. I also have a super spoilery in-depth vlog discussing all the details of this as well as a spoiler free review so I will link those places if you want to do those either the deep dive or the spoiler free version. I also gave four and a half stars to The Dead Cat Tail Assassins by P. Jelly Clark and The Fragile Threads of Power by V.E. Schwab and both of these books I talked about in my latest read or unhaul challenge so I will link that video up above if you want to check it out. These and some forthcoming books were part of that video. I also gave four and a half stars to Dust Tracks on a Road by Zora Neale Hurston. This is her autobiography and I am so glad that I finally read this. It's really good. I have some like structural criticisms a, a little bit but overall I feel like this was enchanting. She's really funny. She's a great storyteller and the especially I would say the first half of the book 
I ate it up. It was so interesting. She goes through her childhood, which was rough, and yet she delivers it with such a lightness of touch and makes things funny, even though clearly some of them were also traumatizing. But her childhood, things that happened, how she ended up where she was. I think one thing that happens in the latter half of the book is the pacing gets a little weird because sometimes she kind of goes off track and gets a little into the weeds about like, you know, giving us backstory of the politics on an island in the Caribbean or things like that. Whereas like the first half of the book is chronological, the later part of it is organized by themed topical chapters and it's a bit of an abrupt shift. That's why four and a half stars. I would say the first half of this book was like a six star reading experience where I was like, is this gonna make my favorites of the year? But then the later part of it, it is a pretty abrupt structural and sometimes tonal shift, but I still liked it. It was still really good. Definitely would recommend picking it up if you haven't. Her life is interesting, fairly easy to read and very accessible and entertaining. So yeah, this was really good. And if you don't know who she is, she was part of of the Harlem Renaissance, a really well-known author who apparently, I didn't know this, was also an academic who studied cultural anthropology. She just led a very interesting life. Then I gave four and a half stars to One Big Open Sky by Lisa Klein Ransom. This is a middle grade novel in verse that is historical fiction. It's a multi-perspective story that follows a Black family traveling from, I think, Mississippi originally in the late 1800s to Nebraska, where they're giving land away to Black families to settle it. And it's really about the, the journey and the struggles that they go through. So it follows three female characters. One of them is a young girl who kind of comes of age through the story, as well as her mom and another character who is introduced a little bit later in the book. It's very accessible. It's easy to read. It's also kind of cool because, you know, I grew up with a lot of these sort of pioneer stories that were usually centering white characters. And so it is interesting to see something from this time period that is a little bit different. And I like it. I liked the characters. I would say the biggest weakness of this book, and this is, again, what kind of dinged it down from a five star read for me, is that it does not adequately address the issue of indigenous people and the fact that this settlement, this promised land for their family, is on land that should have belonged to indigenous people who had been moved off of it. I guess the place on that where this does improve a little bit on previous pioneer type narratives is it pushes back on this idea of indigenous people being savages or being super violent. And I think one of the characters at some point says something like, oh, well, I think they probably only fight back when they're given a reason to do so type thing. So there is that, but I, I feel like for a book being published today for this age group, it could have introduced a little more complexity and nuance to that subject. And so that is my main criticism of this book. Otherwise, I really liked it a lot. It is heavy. They go through a lot. There is loss. There's grief. She's got complicated feelings about her parents coming to realize that her dad is not perfect, even though she loves him. Um, but yeah, overall, I thought this was very good one to have on the radar for teachers and stuff. But I think the added layer of conversation that needs to happen with this is the, the treatment of indigenous people during this time period. So four and a half stars. And uh, this was sent to me for a review from Holiday House. So thank you to them. I also gave four and a half stars to That Time I Got Drunk and Saved a Human by Kimberly Lemming. We're doing a hard pivot there. Um, this is a blast. I love this entire series. It's the third film length novel in a fantasy romance series that is like a romantic comedy. It's got this very tongue in cheek sense of humor that I find super entertaining. I think it's hilarious. And I really enjoyed this book a lot. I just, I, I got such a kick out of it. In this case, we have have a heroine who has been trapped on an island by a dragon for years and keeps trying to escape. And finally, another dragon who is also a human shapeshifter shows up and she drugs him to try to convince him to like get her off the island. And he does, but also he senses her as being his mate. And because he's been drugged, he bites her to claim her as his, which transfers magic to her and links them together. And then it's like him trying to court her <laughs> after the fact. So I like, I think it does a pretty good job 
managing a situation where, you know, you could run into issues with consent and power dynamics, she kind of toes that line relatively well. I think more sensitive readers might not love it, but I really enjoyed it. I thought the main character was funny and just hard-headed and I got a kick out of their dynamics. I thought this was great. Really fun. If you like the series, would recommend this one as well. It was a four and a half star read for me. I have this for review from Nick Alley. I also gave four and a half stars to The Woods All Black by Lee Mandelo. I love his writing so much. Um, yeah, this is maybe my least favorite thing I've read from him, but I still really liked it. It's interesting. It's set in like, I think late 1800s Appalachia, following a nurse who is trans but semi-closeted for the sake of his job. So he's a trans man, but largely lives his life as a woman. And he's been assigned to this small town that is kind of run by a homophobic, hyper-religious pastor. It's got kind of creepy cult vibes. And there's also something dark in the woods, something weird going on. This is a horror novella, but it also has an element of erotic trans romance to it. The romance I wasn't entirely sold on, I'll be honest, which again is why this is a four and a half star and not a five star. It's but but otherwise the vibes were immaculate. I love the horror elements, the creepiness, the vibes, the way that it's dealing with misogyny, the way it's dealing with homophobia and religious zealotry. It's great. It's really good. So if you like Lee Mandela's writing, would recommend. It's not very long. I gave this a four and a half star read. I had it for a review from NetGalley and it comes out pretty soon, I think. My final four and a half star read was a bit of a tome. I have this as an audio review copy from NetGalley, but it's very good and something that I think should be in the hands of a lot of people. This is Trans Children in Today's Schools by Aiden Key. It's a nonfiction book that is primarily written for parents and educators or really anybody who's involved in working in schools or volunteering in schools, and it's really good. The one negative about it is that it's kind of a long book at times it does get a little bit repetitive. However, I kind of understand why it is methodical in going over all of this information. And I think realizes that even though the book is intended to be read kind of cover to cover, some people are going to go to specific chapters that they're interested in topical chapters instead. And so sometimes you get information repeated in those chapters because it's context that is important for people who are not reading the whole book. So that's the one thing that as a reading experience, it might not be ideal. I would recommend the audiobook. I listened to the audiobook and I think that that makes it a little bit easier to get through and more accessible. But I think this is a really important book. There are parts of it that I found really illuminating and really interesting. There are parts of it I found kind of boring, but they would be super important for somebody who's like a school administrator, for instance, or a classroom teacher. So this is a book, man, it, co it covers a lot of ground too. So this is a book that is partly talking about the concept of gender identity, what it is, how it is distinct from sexuality or sexual orientation, and why those things kind of get mixed up sometimes, and why it's especially important to disentangle that when we're talking about trans children. It also gets into the nuts and bolts of how do we create safe spaces for all children in schools, somewhat at home, although the home is not as much the focus. Some of the challenges that trans children and youth go through that their families face. And it's a book that is really empathetic and is speaking to all different kinds of people, regardless of belief system or background or politics. It's something that is intending to kind of pull us together around this thing of caring for our kids, wanting the best for our kids, wanting to create safe spaces for them. And I thought it was excellent at that. I would highly recommend this to anybody who is a parent, whether you're a parent of a trans or gender expansive child or not. If you are a parent at all, I think this is worth reading or at least skimming through. Uh, if you are an educator, a school administrator, I think this is incredibly valuable information. It is written by a person who is an educator on these issues. He goes in and works with specific schools. So he's got a ton of expertise, years of experience going into this, and I just think it's a really excellent book. I picked this up because I saw it on NetGalley for review and as a parent to a gender non-conforming child this was something that was relevant to me personally and I just thought it was 
very, very good. So a uh, great resource. I gave it a four and a half star. And if that sounds like something that would be useful to you or if something you're just interested in, I would recommend it. All right, let's move on to my five star reads. This month there were a lot of them. There were 13. Eight of them. Wow, that's a lot. Eight of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. <laughs> okay, those books are Black Girl, You Are Atlas by Renee Watson, How the Boogeyman Became a Poet by Tony Keith Jr., Red by Annie Carty, Table Titans Club Volume 1 by Scott Kurtz, The Prince and the Dressmaker by Jen Wang, and then three books that were included in my Read or Unhaul video. Those are The City of Stardust by Georgia Summers, The Future by Naomi Alderman, and the Haunting of Velkwood by Gwendolyn Kist. So whew, that's a lot. There were a lot of really fantastic books. So if you want to hear more about those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up or go watch that reader on haul video. I also gave five stars to A Taste of Honey by Kaya Shante Wilson. So I made a recommendation video for Black History Month where I realized I held this book up while describing this book, which is book one in the series, The Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps. So I was talking about this and then I was like, you know, I still haven't read this. I should read this. So I did and I loved it. I do think this one will be a hit for a bigger range of people. It's a little more straightforward and less experimental, but still very, very good. So if Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps was not totally your thing, maybe try this one. This is sci fantasy with a central gay romance. And I don't want to say too much about it, but it's really interesting. I love the writing. There's twists and turns. The character development is really good. And it fits a lot in this novella. I, I really hope we get more from him. He hasn't published anything in a while. And I would love to see more because I love his writing. But yeah, five stars. Definitely recommend the entire series. I also gave five stars to Tender Beasts by Lizelle Sambury. Y'all... Listen, my caveat here is Lizelle and I are mutuals, okay? So feel free to take my review with this a grain of salt. But I feel like, oh my god, she doesn't write a bad book. <laughs> like, this is, it's really good. Some of the things that for me are big selling points about this are not things that are really being highlighted in the marketing. So let me pitch this to you. It is a YA horror meets psychological thriller with cult elements, a serial killer, messy and complicated family dynamics, and a heroine who tries to keep it together and be perfect all the time when she's seething internally and her going on a journey to unleash that and be her true self all the while trying to protect her brother who has been accused of murder and she's not sure if he did it or not. Uh, yeah, it's great. There are so many layers to what's going on here, but if those things sound up your alley, I would highly recommend this. I think it's an excellent book. It's got twists that were unexpected. It's got weird kind of horror type elements. It's got a mystery serial killer element to it with deaths at a school. It's got messy family drama. It's talking about privilege as a person of color, which I think is really interesting. Uh, there, there, there's a lot here. It's really good. Five stars highly recommend. I haven't really heard it being pitched as culty serial killer type thing, but those things are here. And I think if you're into those things, definitely go check it out. So it was great. I also gave five stars to The Brides of High Hill by Nevo. This is the latest novella in the Singing Hill cycle. It's not coming out till May, so I read it a little bit early. So I'm not gonna say too much about it. But y'all, it's got gothic horror vibes. Did not expect that from, from, from Cleric Chi. It's great. Uh, Cleric Chi is accompanying a young bride to her wedding to a much older man at this estate. But there's weird shit going on. It's really good. I loved it. Uh, five stars. So if you like the series, definitely would recommend. It's a hard tonal shift from the last one, which was about grief. This is like gothic horror. <laughs> it, was, it was good. I, I liked it a lot. So yeah, five stars. I gave five stars to Yona of the Dawn volume 11 by Mizuho Kusanagi. I love this series so much. It is a manga series that is political fantasy romance. The romance is slowly starting to like uh, uh, something, something happened here. It was very interesting. Also, this has 
a flashback scene that was adorable with three of our main characters as children together. Loved it. I just, it, it was great. No notes. My final five star read of the month was The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. I finally read this. This was on my classics TBR for the year and it's really good. It's interesting. It's like whimsical and doesn't take itself too seriously but is also drawing on Shakespeare and classic literature and I can definitely see this being one that would absolutely enchant you if you read it as a child and then be something that you would revisit later in life and get something different from. So I can understand why this is some people's favorite book. This has an introduction from Patrick Rothfuss. It is his favorite book, which I think is very interesting. What to say about this? It's, you know, a following the titular Last Unicorn, who is searching for the rest of her people and her adventures and misadventures along the way and the friends and enemies that she makes. <laughs> like, I don't know what else to say about it. It's very accessible. It's easy to read. I think my kids would probably be into this. I could actually see reading this to my kids. I think they would enjoy it. Yeah, it would be a good read aloud book. So five stars. I enjoyed it. I'm glad that I finally got around to it. Lastly, this month I had one book that got six stars, which is a favorite of the year. And this is a book that I was sent for review from Tor because the second book in the series is about to come out. And I really loved this. I feel like this is not going to be a book for everyone. But if this is the book for you, you might also really love it. And that is Night's Edge by Liz Karen. This came out last year. It is in part a dystopian horror novel with vampires, but really it is a book about a complicated codependent mother-daughter relationship where there are addiction issues and sometimes abuse but also love and it's just it's so good. It's rough at times. There's definitely a lot of content warnings for this one of all of those things, but I loved it and I thought this was such a smart take on a vampire story. It's got a dual timeline narrative, so we're following our main character as a 10 year old girl when her mother is first turned. There's like a science-y name for what essentially is being turned into a vampire and she's turned by a kind of creepy abusive boyfriend that she has at the time. So we have the 10 year old dealing with her mom being turned and the traumatic things that she goes through surviving through that period. And then we also see her as a 23 year old living at home with her mom, feeding her mom blood every night, going to work in a bookstore, keeping the secret and just starting to recognize her own sexuality when she gets interested in a lovely barista and realizes like, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe women. Uh, so it has a sapphic element to it. But again, the central relationship in this book is really this mother daughter relationship that is very difficult and complicated. And I just I loved it. It's dealing with abuse and neglect and parentification, addiction issues. It's it's really good. <laughs> So six stars for me. It was definitely one of my favorite things I've read so far this year. I'm excited to see where the story goes in book two. I don't know what it's going to do, but th this was fantastic. So thank you to Tor for sending me a copy. Okay, so there you go. Those are all 35 of the books that I read in the month of February. Overall, it was a really great reading month and I'm, I'm happy with what I read. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. My battery's going to run out again. Great. We'll see if we can get through the rest of this. <laughs> Let me know how your month went. I don't have like a super good question of the day. Tell me what you want to tell me. What, what was one of your favorite books you read? in February. Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.